You're listening to To Hatch a Pod with Key Budge, Corey Costello, Greg Garrett, and Ashley Whitmore. It's To Hatch a Pod time, Key Budge, Corey Costello today. Corey, how are you? Wonderful. It's nice to have you. You've been out running around today, busy schedule. I'm sorry that I left our guests waiting, but uh, they're they're fantastic human beings that oper- that uh, that actually have a very very important business in the region, and so um, you know I'm I'm very happy to be here today with and them for sure. With that, I'll introduce our very patient <laughs> guest today, as we're going to be talking about Rio Tinto in Boron and the impact here in Tehachapi and East Kern and all of Kern County and the global, you know, impact that this business has. And today with us, we have Rennie Dillinger, the general manager. Rennie, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. We're really excited to come up here and uh, talk about our business and uh, share how valuable this community is to our business. And then also we have Tehachapi's very own Mary Beth Garrison. Mary Beth, welcome back. Or actually, no, I shouldn't say welcome back because this is your first time on, but we've, it is. we've, uh, I've interviewed you on on videos and things. So for me, I think this is a return. <laughs> Why? Well, thank you so much. You know, it, it is it is great the work that is being done, uh, both here and then and sharing and letting us tell our story. So that's awesome. Well, let's let's talk about Rio Tinto and this this giant hole that's in the ground <laughs> to the east of us Amen. and you do so many things i'm i say that because i fortunately a couple of years ago i got to take the tour uh, mary beth was gracious enough to get me out there got to go down to the bottom see these monster trucks and uh, the work that's that's being done so let's let's talk about uh, you know rio tinto and then we'll kind of get into the local impact yeah absolutely um So U.S. Borax in Boron, California, we're part of the Rio Tinto Corporation. So Rio Tinto is a global mining organization, one of the largest in the world. Operates in multiple commodities, iron ore, aluminum, copper. You interface with products from Rio Tinto in your daily lives, uh, including U.S. Borax. You may not be aware of it, but you find it throughout your daily life as you drive your vehicles, as you use your phones, etc. And the U.S. Borax part is no story is no different than the Rio Tinto story. It's a global commodity we distribute on most continents across the world. Um, We do supply about 30% of the world's borates on a given year. Um, You interface with this every day. It's it's in renewable energy. It's in glass. It's in fertilizer. It's in fire retardant. Basically, it's in your house. It's in your phone. And it's in the energy industry that you interact with every day. Basically, every family in the world has something that contains a product that comes out of the mine. Absolutely, yes. I even use borax as a laundry additive. As it initially was many, many moons ago, that was everybody's laundry detergent. They still sell it in the box, and it's a great laundry additive to put along with your soap. You throw in the, the borax as well. Well, it also, I've used it right? for late that, your uh, shop. No, huh? I am like, I'm That's like right. thinking Corey could be our, our <laughs> ad guy because some people are confused as to what's U.S. Borax, Borax, a yeah. 20 meal team Borax is, and it is a laundry additive. Mm. You know, our business, uh, that particular product spiked during COVID. Mm. So because people did not want to use bleach to disinfect things, but they wanted things disinfected. So so actually 20 meal team Borax is an amazing additive. It takes out all organics uh, from your from your laundry and and leaves your stuff smelling clean. Yeah. So it's it's great. I use it all the time too. Yay, Corey. <laughs> Yay, MB. I've used it in uh, these homemade uh, remedies for insect control. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, you put yeah. in a spray bottle with uh, water, and all of a sudden you're spraying an area, and now you've done something without adding chemicals. Uh, in- and did you know that taro and killer is the same? It's borax. Oh, oh, yeah. I just put some of those out in my house this morning. Yeah. <laughs> and those were great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you brought up fertilizer, too. I didn't realize a couple of years, was a couple of years back, I learned going to one of the, uh, it might have been the, the dinner you all were sponsoring with State of the County or something like that. And the growers, the orange growers in the valley were talking about how they have to add, you know, the borates to their soil to help the oranges get thick enough peel to survive so they don't split. And that's how the nice, thick orange peel gets made. They put that in the soil. I had no idea. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it, it has a lot of uses beyond oranges as well. Globally, it's in, we look for nutrient or boron deficient soils around the globe and, and then target those markets to provide a variety of our products too for similar uses. Mm-hmm. That's wild. Yeah. It just, you start thinking about every little thing, whether I'm picking up my cell phone or, you know, we, we talk about lithium batteries and all these things, 
all coming just to the east of us from this giant operation that's here in Kern County. And, you know, we've been there uh, for almost 100 years, and we've been in business for 151 years. Wow. And that's pretty cool. We started in Death Valley, and uh, when, we've, when we extracted borates from the floor of Death Valley. But as you can imagine, there were other obstacles, other challenges to doing business there. But we shipped it. That's where the 20 Mule Team uh, came into being, is is taking ore from Death Valley all the way to Mojave, where then it was transported by train. So it's it's we're an old business. We're a proud business. Our legacy runs deep. And... Uh, and we're still in business, and we're still doing good things, and, and quality, safety is still mantras for us. Yeah, safety, you guys, whenever we've done yeah. anything, safety is <laughs> always first and foremost, and totally understand, you don't become, have a global brand and, and grow as large as you do without thinking about safety and making sure you're doing this right. You know, taking care of employees, staff, guests, everyone that, that steps on to the, uh, the facility. Especially the scale of what you all are doing. I mean, right. you've got these trucks that have tires larger than my home uh you know you need to you need to make sure that everybody right is is aware of what's going on in their surroundings and that kind of an operation yeah we really pride ourselves in that when you come in our door as an employee or as a guest that will be the first thing that you hear from us is this is what our site is this is what we do this is what we expect from people that are visitors or employees this is how we expect you to behave you all have a right to stop anything you see that doesn't look right to you ask some questions make sure we're doing it the correct way and we have a really good legacy of, of reliable, safe production out there at the Boron facility and, and our global facility. So you guys well. have a lot of different initiatives. You mentioned production. Um, what What's kind of the, so maybe take us through the old standby production, right? The, maybe how that's going with obviously the, the borates. And then you've got other, I know you've had some lithium exp exploration stuff going on as well. So. Tell us what the production's like, and right now at the uh, at the mine. Yeah, right now we're just coming off a record year. We've we put just over a million tons into market last year, which is one of the highest years we've had in our history. So the plants are running really well. Um, we have a solid customer base that that comes with us each year. They're really committed customers, good customers. Um, and so right now we're all of the the depth of what makes borax is happening. So all of the technical professions, all of the skilled laborers, the electricians, the millwrights, the mechanics, the operators that it takes to quietly in the background make all of these refined borates are, are running well. And we continue to hire. We continue to seek new talent. We continue, we continue to invest our communities and train apprenticeships and new skilled labor to develop the next generation of workers for our, our facility. You know, you bring that up and I don't, you thought about you, you know, hiring and that sort of thing. I don't know a lot of ex employees from your operation. They're usually there and they retire there or they move. That's the only reason why they left. You know, they, I don't know people that used to work there and now they go do something else. They seem to stay, which is a great testament to your company because people obviously feel taken care of and they, you know, there's many different things that go into to human resources, but it sounds like from what I know, people don't, they don't leave there. <laughs> yeah. We like to say we don't offer jobs. We offer careers mm -hmm. and we do have a really good history of people coming enjoying the facility, enjoying communities such as this one to live in and love the quality of life that they enjoy from work to home and they stay. And we have our, uh, our 20 mules playing to our heritage to be on that list. That is our 20 most tenured employees. Mm. You have to have worked at our facility for more than 40 years. Wow. And our number one mule. So the number one mule is the gentleman who has been at the mine the longest. He's been there just this year, 50 Five wow. years. Yeah, I think he was in a video or something uh -huh. not too long ago, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And That's he great. and he has a really super long beard, and he's got long hair, and he looks like Gandalf. <laughs> and so we we kind of put him in that space. So he he's pretty amazing. And I I ask him, so Ron, when when are you going to retire? And he says, MB, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. I I honestly, it is part of who he is. He's a he's a first class electrician, and it it is it's part of who he is, mm -hmm. and he is super proud to be part of the legacy, and as you say, Corey, it is a legacy of employment. It's a lego legacy of stability, all of those sorts of things. Um, and as Rennie noted, safety is our number one thing. So so we make sure you're you're wearing the right high vis that you have the right protective gear. Um, from head to toe. And that's really important. Yeah. 
55 yeah. years for an employee. That's, <laughs> but that I speaks know. to the culture of, you know, of this organization because you just don't find that anywhere. I mean, that's unheard of. I mean, maybe if you owned your own business, if it's a family business, you might stick around and, you know, you know, you work it through till you can generationally pass it down. But with the opportunity to retire, you mean, he's almost probably working for free you know, <laughs> probably. At, probably. at this point because he enjoys, you know, yes. his, yes, his sir. teammates, you know, the camaraderie, everything that's about this, it gives him, you know, goes home at the end of the day going, yep. okay. Yeah, this is the reason why I do it. Yeah, maybe next year. Not like next month or it's he's one bad day away. It's like, eh, who knows, maybe next year we'll, we'll think about retirement. That says volumes. Yeah. Well, oh, we're happy for that next year message too because we're, we're training the next generation of workers. What we can all learn from Ron mm -hmm. is incredible. He's oh, been yeah. there for a third of the company's history. <laughs> yeah. And so what he knows, what he's seen and can share back to the people we bring in the gates every month is you couldn't put a price on that. Yeah, yeah, you start tapping into that institutional knowledge as much as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and that's one thing that I am really proud of is that we honor that institutional knowledge that that in from an inclusion perspective, that is really important to us. And all of those 20 mule that, that Rennie spoke of, all more than 40 years on the job, it's, it's amazing, but we value them. They are in, an important part of our team. So we don't, you know, some people say, okay, trying to move those baby boomers out. Nah, we still embrace them. <laughs> That's awesome. What, uh, what, uh, what other, you know, outside of just the day-to-day, -day, you know, the, the borax, what else is being extracted? What are some initiatives you're working on out there at the, at the facility? So we're working on quite a few things. Um, uh, on the product development side, we've we've had our publicly released you know lithium project that we're in final review on. We're mm -hmm. doing our final plant designs, things like that, to seek approval. Um, but things that we've successfully implemented recently, we've uh, transitioned our entire haulage fleet, the giant mining f trucks that you can see on the YouTube videos, etc. We've trans transitioned them all to renewable diesel. So we're the first mining site in the world to do that. And so we're really proud of that. That initiative is done. We're not in process. We're not studying that. That is done. We've partnered with our vendors, um, with our engine providers, and then through Rio Tinto and made that happen. So we were, we're really proud of that. That had to be a massive undertaking because you brought it up to, to go through the engine, engine providers. Like you don't want to run something through those engines because those vehicles are not cheap. Right. And uh, they are massive. You don't just go pick one up off the lot. Uh, so obviously there's probably a lot of background and studies and, you know, just make sure everything's going to fire like normal. Absolutely. Just a, a haul truck like that will cost you around $5 million. <laughs> An engine is worth, give or take, 700000 to a $1 million. Wow. So when you start putting fuel through it, you want to make sure that it's done well. You don't want to void your warranty, just like you don't yeah. on your car at home. <laughs> and you want to make sure that's all done really well. So we partnered with our vendors to make sure that we're doing the studies that we need to do, the wear analysis we needed to do to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And we're really proud of that journey because it happened quickly and it was done really well. What is the, uh, I'm, I'm curious on the, um, we, when this MB might be kind of your your area, we, we've, Tashby plays a pretty important role. A lot of folks that work there, like I said, I know people that work there, they live here. Um, so there's a lot of that. But the economic impact of, to I guess, the entire Kern County, and I guess Tashby to a point, but this operations you know, economic impact to the county is pretty substantial. It is. We have the seventh largest taxpayer in the county of Kern. And so we hold that flag up very proudly because – a lot of uh, the tax base in Kern County is on the west side. Yeah. And so so that gives us a loud voice in government. <laughs> and um, but but in terms of economic impact for the region, uh, we have more than a hundred of our employees that live in Tahajbi. And so they bring they they make good salaries, they come back home, they eat in our restaurants, they they buy stuff. Um, in our stores. And so that impact every single day is pretty important. But, you know, closer to home, to Boron, we, we know that 80% of the people that are employed work at the mine. 80%. Wow. That's a huge number. And so we understand the importance that, that every decision we make has on that community. So one of the things that we've been working on, Rennie and I have been 
sort of tag team in this is some external revenue opportunities. We have 20,000 acres that sit outside our mine, and, and that land is super valuable. It is right now in the process of being rezoned M3, which for those who don't know, that's pretty pretty amazing. That's an industrial zoning. And so you can do pretty much anything. Not that we're going to, but it gives us flexibility. And one of the things I, I know I really want, Rennie, I'm going to toss the ball to him, is talk about our Pozzolan project. It's so cool. Yeah, absolutely. I, w- I do want to side up, a sidestep for just a second, give a shout out to the city of Tehachapi. I've seen the amount of people that we employ that reside in Tehachapi grow and grow and grow over yeah. my years. So I just want to give a shout out to <laughs> how well this community is doing and attracting Yay. people. Well, MB's around a lot and she <laughs> goes to a lot of meetings and brags a lot about Rio Tinto. So it's probably has something to do with it. And you know, it's joint because uh, Rennie thinks the only community I talk about is so he's like he's like does the city pay you and just for the record the city does not pay me but um but i love it here and you know i've been here for 35 years and so i I'm almost an old timer. Well, you know, it, 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 it's an important. We talk about this a lot. Tehachapi plays a very supportive role in yes. stuff around us. Yeah. We don't have the mines. We don't have the turbines here in the city. They're just outside on the hill. We don't have, you know, the the cement production. It's just outside the city. But you know, we have that. We're the employer base for a lot of those folks. And then there's other businesses that do benefit as a result. They service, you know, the contractors that service the the cement plants, or you know, they service the renewables, or they work at at the mine, that sort of thing. So. Yeah, there's a lot of that sort of support role that we play for for Eastern Kern in general, and even Western Kern in certain spots. So, and it's absolutely crucial for us as we attract talent to have really great communities for our employees to live in. Mm-hmm. So you're doing really well. Yeah. Uh, back to the partnerships. So we, like MB said, we have the land out in front. We're working with Kern County to zone that as M3, so that allows for heavy industrial use cases. If you think about a mining facility, there is an end to that, right? The, the life does end because at one point you extract all the resources. Mm-hmm. Now, we still have a, a long future in front of us, but we're thinking out, you know, decades in the future. What does it look like for Eastern Kern and the, the economic benefit that we're providing right now after we're gone? And so we're attracting industrial partnerships. We do have two currently. One that MB alluded to is a Poslin provider. There's a company called CR Minerals that we've reached an agreement with. They're going to come to our facility and and lease some of our land. They're going to build their own plant and they're going to take some of the byproduct from our facility over the last hundred years of operation and they're going to reprocess it and sell it into the cement industry, into mm. the major providers around Southern California. That's right. I remember hearing about that. Makes it, it makes it stronger, correct? It, it does. Is, yeah. It has a lot of really interesting properties that I've learned a lot about through that partnership and that'll also reduce the greenhouse gases from the entire cement industry as it's already been... It, cooked effectively yeah. through our process. So now they don't have to do that. So it'll have a carbon abatement impact as well as economic vitality for Eastern Kern County and some of the surrounding communities. And that's where the technology of today comes in because you brought up the fact you've had, you know, hundred plus years of byproducts and tailings or whatever, but now you're finding because the technology, you can now figure out, Hey, there is some stuff usable that 75 years ago, it wasn't necessarily usable, but now it is, we need the lithium, we need whatever it might be. So it seems like the technology now is actually, and that might even help expand the life of the facility because now the stuff you already dug up is valuable again too, because there's other things in there now. That's right. And we have a really, really talented, skilled labor base, right? The people that work out in the Eastern Kern at our facility are, are very impressive. They know their fields in depth, it can be millwrights, electricians, et cetera, diesel mechanics, et cetera. They're really talented, skilled labor which is hard to access and train in, in Southern California. So mm-hmm. finding other uses is, as time goes forward to provide that type of employment is especially critical because the infrastructure is there. There are people there, generational families that have those skills in-house. You want to continue to provide those type of jobs to the region. You don't become 151 years old without vision for the future and evolving with what's going on today and looking at tomorrow. So to just to think about, you know, longevity, if you got, mm-hmm. okay, mine life, but what else, what else, what else? And you've seen it through taking your tailings and finding these other minerals that can be used and it becomes, it, it just re, recreates, you know, what the, I guess it adds to your product line, it, all these different things, but that's, that's how a strong company stays around for 151 years. One of the things I, I'd like to point out is because of our size, while we're the largest open pit mine in California, 
We're not the largest open pit mine in the world. And Rio Tinto has a lot of big mines. Um, But one of the things that our size enables us to be agile and so, so when Rennie comes up with an idea or any of our, our people come up with an idea, we can look at it, we can test it, we can pilot it and say, oh my goodness, this might work. And so that's, that's really what happened with Pozzolan. That's what happened with lithium. We, when we found lithium in our tailings, it was because we were looking for gold. So, mm. so other mines started looking in their tailings and they went, oh my goodness, gold is here. Well, we don't have any gold in Eastern Current, <laughs> just, just for the record, but, but they did find lithium. And so, so it's very curious as you talk about technologies and you talk about innovation, um, just really how that has been an important part of our journey. Yeah. And as we look here at the renewable industry and the battery storage mm-hmm. and, and all of this technology as we move to the electric cars and there is a huge need for certain products. And I would bet lithium is one of those that's like, uh, yeah, we need that. And there's <laughs> probably people, there's probably that industry is fighting over getting that resource. Oh, absolutely. Lithium is, is absolutely a critical mineral going forward to establish an EV industry, battery storage for the grid, uh, for the power for your home. And then there's other minerals that Rio Tinto produce that are equally as important. Copper. When you start electrifying, copper becomes extremely important, just like our Kennecott operations up in Utah. So there's a whole facet of technologies and infrastructure and um, commodities that have to be brought to the surface to be able to enable this transition that we're going to go through in the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. And you, you mentioned it's not the largest in the world. I can't imagine one bigger, though. I mean, it's crazy, right? I mean, I, just the scale to whether you're at the visitor center, uh, which we can talk about in a few minutes, but whether it's your visitor center just looking out over, you know, this kind of Grand Canyon, you know, it's a type hole, or as Key pointed out, and I've done the same thing, going down to the bottom and feel like you're, you know, at the base of the world's largest coliseum with all these walls around you. I just can't imagine anything bigger. One of our visitors just said when he had the opportunity to go to the bottom of the pit, he said, it's like having the Grand Canyon right in yeah. our county. <laughs> Who knew it was even here? And and that's a funny thing because so many people will tra- will traverse Highway 58. They'll travel from Tatchby, maybe going to Vegas, maybe going elsewhere, but they're like, what is that over there? So you don't see the hole yeah. until you come and visit us mm-hmm. at the Visitor Center. Yeah, talk about the Visitor Center real quick. I mean, oh. it's it's a great facility, a museum. It's got a great viewing area. Uh, you know, what can folks expect if they want to pop into the Visitor Center? You know, I always tell, I always invite people to come because I think it's a, it's a really good uh, trip down memory lane. You'll see some of our... Some of our artifacts, essentially, which are industrial artifacts, our ore carts, things like that. You'll see a, re- a replica of our 20 mule team. Uh, the wagons are real, but the fiberglass mules, of course, are not. <laughs> but you, you would see exactly how long that team was. And, and if you envision how they came over the Sierra Nevadas to get to Mojave, it's it's something to see. But, but my favorite part is... Um, in a step towards just making sure that all of our visitors felt like they were included, we just recently added this viewing platform. Mm-hmm. And the platform goes all the way out to the edge of the pit and, and is ADA compliant. And anyone can go and look over the ledge and say, oh, my gosh, I see inside the pit. We don't allow visitors to go to the bottom Every single day, we open our doors one once a year, and it is a very um, it's a very well attended and appreciated event mm-hmm. because it gives you that that other viewpoint that viewpoint from the bottom, and you can see how grand the operation is. What is the depth? It's uh, over eight hundred feet in depth right now. On its way to go over a thousand. I was going to say, yeah, and climbing or sinking, whichever however way you put it, as it gets deeper. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> a little bit bigger every day. Yeah. So I see the viewing platform, the future, a glass bottom. You know, like one of the those, those, the skywalk. <laughs> yeah, Grand Canyon look. Yeah. yeah, that look down. You know. Yeah. So I, I could see that would be an, a, an attraction. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that recommendation back to our our team and see what they say to me. It, it might be colorful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be. Uh, that, 
I, I'd make another trip out just to go, <laughs> go stand on it. My wife wouldn't step on it. She was like, no, no, I'm not doing that. No chance. Yeah. So inside yeah. the visitor center, you also have an idea of what the buildings that you see are and what they do and how we process or and how we take it from a large chunks to smaller pieces to the refined borates that we sell all around the world. So it tells you that story and it also has a display of uh, the products. As Renny was speaking to earlier, there are more things. It's in it's in Bosch and Lam, you know, contact. Mm-hmm. Did you know that? Yeah, you put it in your eye. So so it's it's amazing how versatile the products. I knew it was in, you know, smart devices. I didn't realize why, and it was because of the heat control. Correct. So like your phone would be too hot to touch without you know the 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 borates in the in the glass and, and, and that sort of thing. I didn't realize that until I think so, one of your last videos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the videos are very informative. I learn something every time. Okay, I, I'll have to figure out what we're going to say yeah. next. But, <laughs> but one of the things, Corning wear. So Corning is one of our longest um, customers. Well, you know how you can take Corning from the refrigerator to the oven? It's because of borates. Hmm. Yeah. So there you go. That's awesome. Well, let's talk about opportunity. And you are... As we've talked with uh, some other businesses in East Kern, it's about there's opportunity. There is employment. There are, as you said, careers that are available. And let's let's dive in there. Yeah, absolutely. So we're always looking for skilled labor, technical professions. The Boron part of Rio Tinto is a global organization. We hire almost every profession imaginable from university train, trade school, and also if you have a high school education and a driver's license, we can train you. You can come out and work in our labor pool. You can come in as an operator and be trained up through the ranks. And there's countless success stories like that. So, you know, on our website, we'll always have roles posted because we're always hiring and training because, again, we got our eye on the future. When we bring people in, we're investing significantly in them. It can be years of training to become an electrician, to be a a really skilled millwright. And so we're thinking three, four, five, six years from now, what does our labor force need to look like? In spite of current economic conditions, good or bad, we need to be able to ensure that this business that we inherited with 150 years of legacy, that we make sure we lead it through the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So there is opportunity for literally anyone of any skill level to either be trained into a profession or come in with skills and start on a floor uh, working in whatever their trade may be. That's right. What are some of the the challenges that if someone's listening, they're not from the area, and they go, what what are the questions that they'll ask? And they're they're interested, and they go, but it's in Boron. You're in the Mojave Desert. What's uh, you know what what are some of those kind of questions that you see, and then and how you overcome it? Because you got staff that's been on fifty five years. You got to be offering something that's <laughs> like that's not available other places, you know. And I'm sure the city of Tehachapi is probably on that chart. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in one of those things that you hear and, and how you, you answer those questions. Oh, absolutely. As we recruit people, one of the things, if, if you're not familiar with this region of California, you don't understand it. And yeah. that's, so that's a hurdle for us to overcome. People don't generally understand the quality of life that's available between the economic employment opportunity we provide and places like Tehachapi and our other partnering communities that living in. People don't understand what it's like. They may have a mental image of what living in California is. And, and being a, a person who's moved from other parts of the U.S. here, you, you actually genuinely don't understand what's available to you here until you experience it. The best thing I was ever told was when we, my wife and I moved here. They, they said, be patient. In six months, the desert will grow on you. And, and, <laughs> and that was right. That was absolutely right. Yeah. And, and that's one of the initiatives, too, I know really countywide and and we've dealt with this in the city and, and other cities as well, have really focused on keeping that talent here because they already understand the area and you don't have that culture shock, so to speak, when you're bringing somebody in and they're like, what have I done? This I've never seen you know, this kind of desert le- landscape or whatever it might be. Um, so I think there's been a bit of focus on letting the next generation of high school students know like, you don't have to necessarily – leave you don't have to live at home either but you've got great opportunities around you and that just helps clear one more hurdle with not having to convince anybody that this is a great spot to work in that is 100 percent true and and you know i will take the drive to boron 
over the drive to Bakersfield any sure. day of the week. Yeah, uh, it's 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 actually an easy drive. It it no worries, and and we don't have a hill to climb, <laughs> and and yet I'm able to come home um, to the place I love. And, and that's how people feel. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is we still have a lot of our number one community is, is Boron. Mm-hmm. So still a lot of local, local talent, generational talent, as Rennie spoke of. And, and you're right. When you don't have to teach people what the Mojave Desert is, you don't have to sell them on it. Yeah. It's you know, that's a big hurdle overcome already. And and we have m- countless stories of people coming in with high school degrees and retiring as a first-class electrician, first-class millwright, all those things, those skill trades that we actually invested in them and trained. That's great. Randy, I'm curious about your story. What you mentioned, you obviously were other places before you got here. So what was the journey like to get to, to the facility in Boron? Yeah, I've, I've worked in mining and in different facets through my career. So I had, I had worked in the Midwest. I've worked down in Texas. And the opportunity came out at the Boron facility uh, to come work in the active mine here at Boron. And it was a, it's actually, if, if you work in the industry, you know Boron because it's actually a really storied mine site. So it was very intriguing to myself and came out here, took a look and decided to take a leap of faith. And it's been a great place. Um, Seven years later, really happy that made the move. Um, it's been great from a professional front. It's been great from a family front. And like I said, the quality of life here is incredible yeah. when living in this region. And it's still, for most people too, it's still a fairly affordable region to live in by California standards. Um, and so there's that as well. That certainly helps, you know, whether there's somewhere right by in Boron or they're here in Tehachapi and even, even areas of the Antelope Valley, they're still relatively affordable compared to what you're dealing with statewide and other labor markets, that's for sure. Even in other states, especially metro areas of other states, our cost of living did not drastically change moving here from Texas at the mm-hmm. time. Um, housing markets have changed a bit, but and you spoke earlier of, of people who are already here. One of the biggest hurdles we have, raising awareness socially, um, skilled labor jobs aren't always the first thing that come to mind for people, especially young people looking to get into the labor market. It may not be what they always see on Instagram or social media of any type. And raising awareness of how good of jobs they are, how what the pay is like, what the family life is like, they come with benefits, they come with retirement packages, and, and how how skilled and how intelligent the people are who do these type of jobs and, and raising the appeal of these jobs to people and the awareness that they're out here. You don't have to leave to get a really great job that you'll be proud of. Mm-hmm. And you learn a, a skill that's become very, it's more and more valuable now, um, you know, just because of trades and that sort of thing. And so folks are compensated very well to learn these skilled trades anymore. And so it'd be, yeah, any, any high school students that are getting close to grad, you know, think, getting their senior year graduation time, thinking about what am I going to do? I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not college bound necessarily. Like they are, these are great opportunities. Absolutely, so. totally true, and and that's one of the messages that when we do school uh, interactions, we try to tell, we try to tell our stories. So so when we go into the high school classroom. I have, I have people with college degrees and I have people with high school degrees and then I have, people, I have people that run the gamut because I think it's important to understand who your audience is and not everyone is college bound mm-hmm. and that's okay yeah. because we uh, have a shortage of skilled labor as it is and, and it's an attractive, it's a great career. As Rennie's pointed out earlier, uh, we offer a career, not a job. Yeah, And I think, so part of that, is you you mentioned coming out at the ground floor maybe you don't, you're not in that skilled set yet but you have training available and if you're the you've got your your mindset is i'd like to kind of steer this way that opportunity may exist and you can go hey we we can get you in at the ground floor and let's teach you from the ground up let's train you from the ground up so i mean and you're getting paid to work Learn. towards an area you want to go to so that's that's pretty much unheard of. That's not a, you know, a universal skill that, or things, things that corporations do is they want a done skill set. I can plug you in. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, we can help build you. Mm -hmm. And I I love that. So one of the things that I find fascinating about that is someone may come in 
and may have known someone who was a welder. I want to be a welder. I want that's what I want to do. They'll come into our labor pool and then all of a sudden they see an HVAC person or they see a plumber or they see a first class electrician and they're like, I don't want to be a welder anymore. Mm-hmm. I want to do this other thing. And so that is the is is super um, important that people understand they can tiptoe into all these different areas till they find the fit that's for them and then be trained up to to then take those roles. So so of our 20 mule team, I would say 80% started in the labor pool and now all of them are skilled tradesmen. That's and they're and they're still there. Yep. 40 plus still years. There. <laughs> I mean, Ron started in the labor pool and now he's a first class electrician with 50 55 years behind wow. him. That's, those are success stories, and that's what you build upon and you, you grow with. So if someone's listening, where do we want to send them so they can look for this opportunity? You can just go right to borax.com. We kept it simple. Don't, don't worry, Rio Tinto, all those things, but borax.com and look under careers. Awesome. Okay. Great. Okay, anything else that we haven't uh, touched on that you guys wanted to mention? I know there's a lot of community involvement that – you know, your team believes in, you're, you're here, we see you here in Tehachapi all the time, MB, you're, you know, and the things that you've done at Boron, we've heard about that, but I know that it's, well, I mean, it's true. I mean, you guys, if, you know, as you said, 80% of your work or the, the community works on at, at the site. So you guys make sure you're feeding back into the community and mm-hmm. taking care of quality of life and things for, you know, those that uh, make sure that Borax and Rio Tinto is moving forward. So one of the things, so my core community, of course, is Boron Desert Lakes, North Edwards. And so I work with that community to identify gaps and then and then and actually partner with them to fill those gaps. Last year was a big victory. It was a three-year journey to redo their swimming pool, and it's done and it's packed every single day this year. And it's and and one of the uh, high schoolers said it's like a bougie bougie school pool. <laughs> anyway, so it's I and that's not my my words, but his. And and so now the county is investing in the community. We're redoing the sign, the welcome sign in the Boron. We're, I'm working with businesses. We're going to have a grant program for businesses. But then I, I go outside my core communities into my employee communities, of which Tehachapi is one. So we're going to be a proud sponsor of the Apple Festival, of Tehachapi Mountain Festival, of Cheers to Charity. So we are sponsoring events that matter to this town because our employees live here. This is where they call home, so it's important to us. So you invest in the quality of life. Correct. For your for everyone. Yes. So that's that's another one of those positive things that mm-hmm. you know you hear corporate likes to do this, but you actually you know go out there and do it. So that's a, a very you know make make sure we say thank you for that reinvestment back into your communities because yeah. it also trickles out to those of us that don't work at the mine. You know when we see investment and we see corporate sponsor, those things do have an impact on everyone else as well. The funniest thing is when I'm at the mine, everyone thinks that I'm a, uh, all I do is talk about Tehachapi. When I'm in Tehachapi, <laughs> everyone thinks all I do is talk about <laughs> Boron. US Borax. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, and I do both both ways That's a good balance, with enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah right? it's good balance. With enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Anything else we that you'd like to mention that we haven't touched on? No, we just really appreciate the work and effort that goes into the city of Tehachapi as well being run as well as it is, the stewardship and the quality of life that you provide. And then forums such as this that kind of remove some of the veil around how, how cities work and governments work and your podcast forum. We really appreciate that you're doing this and, and the opportunity to be here. We'll just help paint the entire picture too to talk about the partnerships and again, the support role that we play because it is valuable to you all to be able to in, attract certain employees, especially those maybe with young families that need to have a little more space or they they want more, you know, the desert maybe isn't for them. And so to have the option to come, you know, into Hatchby, live here, that certainly helps. So yeah, that's, we, this is how the business succeeds around us here and around us is because got to, you know, have an attractive option for option for a place to live and and play. And so this is, we try to do that. So. And what has always been awesome about the city is that you've always honored the legacy 
and the impact that the U.S. borax mine has mm -hmm. yeah. on the community. You understand that. You understand that while we want to create a great quality of life here, and I think as as a team, that's what we do, uh, it's, it's important that we understand and appreciate where people actually are employed. Yeah, So exactly. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, there, again, this is another one of these conversations we have. I learn a lot as we have these discussions. So I appreciate the time and the extra time that you got to spend with us today. And uh, that's a little poke at Corey. Yeah, Corey was running late. Well, technically, so. you know, we had with this podcast was scheduled by somebody else who forgot he was on vacation today. So, so. He'll, he'll, let's just <laughs> we'll, we'll get this. Ed. He'll probably be on vacation when he listens yes, to it. Exactly. <laughs> so uh -huh. that'll be good. Yeah. So, so wink, wink, nod, nod, Greg. We're uh, we're talking about Great. you. Hope you guys are enjoying your vacation. But. Uh, but uh, Mary Beth, Rennie, thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, one of the takeaways is you got to come up here where it's uh, probably 15 to 20 degrees cooler. <laughs> so there is that side thing that we, we are able to offer. Yeah. Uh, but we do appreciate the time and uh, your investment in the community. Well, thank, thank you. you. Folks, if you've got a thought or a question uh, based on today's conversation, a suggestion for a future show, send it to us at media at TehachapiCityHall.com. We appreciate the time you spend with us, and we'll catch you again soon right here on Tehachapod. Tehachapod is a conversation about Tehachapi, featuring the community members who make this such a special place to call home. If you have a question or a thought you'd like to share, email media at TehachapiCityHall.com. Thank you to Gary Mazzola for sharing his song, This is Tehachapi.